In this video, I will be going over the dual processing model of thinking and decision making. Daniel Kahneman is a researcher who has been the front runner of this model, along with several other researchers who have contributed to what we understand today. According to this model, there are two different systems of processing information that we have. And both of these systems have distinct characteristics and function under different circumstances. System one is the system that functions and processes information fast, automatically, unconsciously, and on instinct. It usually involves making decisions about everyday life tasks. These decisions are based on past experiences and knowledge that we have established, which basically are your pre-existing schemas, as you already know. Thinking and decision-making through the system focuses on what is seen, and most of the time ignores absent evidence or information. Having said that, this system relies highly on shortcuts that we've created over time, and hence, Thinking and decision-making made through this system are usually prone to errors and biases. System 2, on the other hand, functions slowly, effortfully, consciously, and rationally. This system works with more abstract concepts. It considers and weighs out all the possibilities to arrive at the best decision. And this is grounded in logic and reasoning. It requires con more concentration and even more efforts. And this system also tends to be more reliable than system one. A point to highlight here is that system two makes thinking and decision making more reliable. This doesn't mean that all decisions made through system two are the best decisions. It is also really a question and questionable as to whether human beings as a whole are able to truly step out of their pre-existing schemas, beliefs, and values, and be objective in making decisions even when processing through system two. System one is also the more dominant system for the very reason that I just mentioned, meaning that we function um, on a day-to-day -day basis primarily based off of system one. An example of System 1 and System 2 processing can be with sports, let's say football. If you're someone who has played for some time now, it doesn't take a lot of effort for you to respond to different situations in a game accordingly. Without little effort, you know that when your opponents are making a counterattack, you need to fall back and defend. Even something as simple as restarting the game once your team or your opponents have scored a goal doesn't require a lot of processing and happens almost automatically. And the more experience you have playing the sport, the lesser your system too uh, is really working. In line with the same example, system two processing can be something the coach or manager is engaging in to come up with a pregame or halftime strategy. But with, ex with experience, this is also something that can shift to system one thinking because they already know how to respond to different situations in a game um, or different types of teams and their dynamics um, from their previous experiences. The same can be with regards to skills such as playing an instrument or even driving a car. Another example of the dominance of system one can be with regards to ethics and justice around prejudice and discrimination of specific minority groups in our society. If our society has had a past um, with discriminating a specific group and that this has been normalized over some time, we are probably to function based off of our schemas about that group, which may then influence our interactions with them. If we did decide to shift to system two processing, we may be able to identify the wrong and discriminating against that group and also people in general. But again, making that shift requires more effort 
And it is just easier for you to base up your interactions or your attitude towards a specific group um, based on your past experiences and your society's attitudes towards them instead of truly rationalizing um, whether your behavior towards them is right or wrong. The dominance of System 1 can be explained through the law of least effort. As we all already know, human beings are cognitive misers, which basically again means that we are lazy thinkers. I have repeated this several times, and if you haven't been able to pick up this term, it also shows that you are a cognitive miser <laughs> and aren't paying enough attention into the video lectures. So as we... Um, like I said, as we are cognitive misers, we prefer or we are prone to putting in the least effort into thinking and decision making. And this is done to avoid cognitive load or overload and also to avoid ego depletion, which is the loss of self-control and willpower and also your motivation. We also know that when we are confronted with evidence that challenges our pre-existing schemas and beliefs and values, we can experience cognitive dissonance, which is a state of stress, um, basically caused by new evidence or new information in the environment that does not or challenges uh, our pre-existing schemas uh, and knowledge. So again, we want to avoid experiencing that kind of discomfort and stress, so then we stick to our pre-existing schemas uh, and are resistant to change for most part. And again, if we do want to change and we do want to shift, it will require us to process that information through system to look at the evidence and all the counter evidence provided against our beliefs and our schemas to then re-establish or um, accommodate or even assimilate the new information into our schemas. So based on this law and nature of human cognitive processing, we create shortcuts to get through everyday life. And these shortcuts are what we refer to as heuristics. There are different types of heuristics of which availability, representative, and base rate heuristics are a few. Availability heuristics rely on the immediate examples that come to our mind. For example, when asked to identify the top cause of death, one may think of cancer and not cardiovascular diseases because there is more availability of evidence on cancer as a cause of death with all the research that we're exposed to, news and even movies that have been produced around the people's experience of cancer. Representative heuristics are shortcuts that rely on our mental prototypes. So if I were to mention doctors and nurses and ask you to visualize um, a doctor and a nurse, one is likely to associate doctors to being a male figure and a nurse to be a female figure. Finally, there is the base rate heuristic, which is when we use the current information or probability that is provided to us and ignore all previous probabilities and evidences for that topic or for that situation. In the previous lesson, I asked you to rank 10 causes of death in the order of topmost cause of death per year to the bottommost. And these were the results that your class got as a whole, and this is the ranking that you uh, collectively put together. Cancer, road accidents, and suicide are the top three causes according to your ratings, whereas natural disasters, neonatal disorder, uh, disorders, and drowning were in the bottom three. And these are the actual ratings according to a 2017 data set. The top three causes according to this data um, and from the list that I gave you are cardiovascular diseases right at the top, cancer, and neonatal disorders. It is likely that you chose cancer over cardiovascular diseases um, due to the fact that heart attacks are not typically reported on the news, nor do I really know of a movie that romanticizes two patients with cardiovascular diseases falling in love. But there is a huge difference between how many people die of cardiovascular diseases as opposed to cancer. 
Neonatal disorders are the third most likely to cause death, according to the li uh, according to this data list or data set. Um, and as a class, you rated it to be one of the least causes of death, right at the bottom as the ninth most or ninth least from this list at least. Um, this can be ad attributed to maybe you not knowing what neonatal disorders are or neonatal deaths are. And again, the availability of information on that cause um, as something that causes death. Road accidents are also potentially common to the places that we all belong to in Asia, which results in or could explain why it is number two on your list, even higher than cardiovascular diseases. Terrorism being ranked fifth in, uh, is also based on how media portrays news about this, but in reality, not many people truly die from terrorist attacks and they are, and terrorist attacks are in fact not as frequent as we think they are. Another interesting point to note is your collective choice of placing drug use disorders as being a more likely cause of death than alcohol use disorders. This could be attributed to our attitude towards the two substances. Alcohol consumption is a lot in a lot of societies and cultures are normal, whereas drug use still holds a lot of stigma and legal consequences. It is also likely that there is higher news coverage of drug-related deaths as opposed to um, alcohol-related de deaths. And we know that there are a lot of celebrities who have been uh, scrutinized because of their um, drug addiction and drug dis uh, dis disorders and also misuse. Drowning, surprisingly, causes more death than we all thought. You guys gave it at, uh, right at the bottom, but it is around number six, which is surprising to me as well. So there are a lot of people who do actually die from drowning. So now that we understand the two systems and heuristics, you will pause this video and brainstorm example, examples of your own. One real life situation wherein you use system one and one real life si situation where you use system two. You will also add one real life situation wherein you think that you can or have to make the switch between system one to system two. Okay? You will add your responses on the Padlet link that I have provided on Teams. There are a lot of researches that support the dual processing model. Frisky and Kahneman have conducted a series of researches themselves that have investigated and supported the model. One that I adapted when I first introduced the cognitive approach unit to you was their experiment on the framing effect. I asked you with regards to the dilemma of the coronavirus, and most of you did in fact base your responses on whether the programs were positively framed or negatively framed, even though all of them in fact um, have the same rate of death and survival regardless of their frame. Another research conducted by Tversky and Kahneman in 1974 aimed to investigate the representative heuristic. Let's consider the following scenario. A certain town is served by two hospitals. In the larger hospital, about 45 babies are born each day. And in the smaller hospital, about 15 babies are born each day. As you know, about 50% of all babies are boys. However, the exact percentage varies from day to day. Sometimes it may be higher than 50% and sometimes lower. For a period of one year, each hospital recorded the days on which more than 60% of the babies were born boys. Which hospital do you think recorded more such days? The large hospital, the small hospital, or would it be about the same within 5% of each other? A 
a lot of you may think that the right answer is number three and that both hospitals would have the same probability of having more baby boys born. 78% of the participants in the researchers' study got the answer wrong, and 56% of them chose answer number three, when in reality, the correct answer is the smaller hospital. The larger hospital um, would have more babies born, basically then meaning that it has a larger sample and a higher likelihood for the probability to be closer to the average or at 50-50. Whereas the smaller hospital, which sees about three times lesser births per day, is more likely to have disproportionate days where 60% or more of the babies are born boys. This mistake is made basically because we assume that because the birth rate of girls and boys is 50-50, the birth rate in both the hospitals would also be 50-50. This is a result of using system one to make our decision and using the representative heuristic, wherein we are using the 50-50 boy to girl birth rate to represent the probabilities um, about birth rates in specific hospitals, even though this is incorrect. Another common test is the Wason selection task, which you did during the Mentimeter activity. Participants are presented with four cards and a rule that they need to test the validity of by turning the cards over. In this case, which two cards must be turned over to test the idea that if a card shows an even number on one side, then its opposite side is red. Most people are likely to turn over the card three and the red card. The truth is, if the card three or number three card is turned over and it is red, it doesn't violate the rule that they have stated here. And if the red card is turned over and it is an odd number, that doesn't violate the rule either. On the other hand, if we do turn eight over and it is not red, it does violate this rule. And if we turn brown over and there is an even number, it does violate the rule. This mistake or error uh, is an example of confirmation bias which is our tendency to look for evidence that supports or confirms our schemas or, in this task, the rule. Rather than turning over cards that would reject and violate the rule, we are turning over the cards that would confirm and accept the rule. Griggs and Cox extended this task by giving one group of participants abstract problems and other group, uh, the other group comprehensive real-life problems. One example could be, for example, if there is a male's name on one side of the card, then there is an IB subject on the other side of the card. Select those cards that you definitely need to turn over to determine whether or not the cards are violating the rule. So this is one of the um, tasks or questions, which is considered to be an abstract problem. The other problem on the right-hand side is the more realistic problem. Imagine you are a police officer on duty. It is your job to ensure that people conform to certain rules. The cards below have information about four people sitting at a table. On one side of a card is a person's age, and on the other side of the card is what a person is drinking. Here is a rule. If a person is drinking beer, then the person must be over the age of 18. Select those cards that you definitely need to turn over 
to determine whether or not the people are violating the rule. Is John and football. And the second one is drinking beer and 16 years of age. If you are like most people, you probably got the second one correct and the first one wrong. The researchers found and concluded that participants make fewer mistakes when asked to make a decision about a less abstract task. This is one of the drawbacks of experiments investigating thinking and decision making because a lot of the times the tasks tend to be abstract and trick questions which may not necessarily be ecologically valid in explaining thinking and decision-making as it occurs in real life. Another research that has found a biological basis for the two systems was conducted by Bichara et al. in 2000. The ventromedial prefrontal cortex is known to be responsible for the regulation of impulsive behavior. We also know from our study of Phineas Gage that damage to his prefrontal cortex that happened due to an accident resulted in him becoming disinhibited. He would swear more, he would get angry, um, he, his behavior had changed completely from before his accident. Bichara et al., for the purpose of this investigation, recruited individuals with damaged VMPFCs and healthy control participants. Both groups of participants took part in the IOVA gam gambling task, which basically involves four decks of cards, which participants have to draw cards from um, for a total of 100 rounds. Two of the decks have cards that result in participants gaining high initial rewards, but in the long term have higher risks of losing. And the other two decks had lower initial risks and low rewards, but ensured that there would be a gradual increase of rewards over the course of the game. It was found that the healthy participants, um, or the healthy, healthy control group, uh, on an average realized by around round 30 that there was two decks that were disadvantaged and then hence made the shift to choosing cards from only the two low-risk and low-reward decks. The participants with the VMPFC damage were unable to make the shift and understand that they, they were drawing disadvantaged cards, or yeah, from the decks, which then helps us deduce that the ventromedial prefrontal cortex is responsible for system 2 functioning. These participants, um, with their brain damage, were unable to, or rather were oblivious to the future and long-term gains of um, drawing cards from the advantaged decks, and were instead guided by immediate prospects of high rewards from the disadvantaged decks. So the VMPFC can be localized to be responsible for thinking past initial impulses, weighing up different factors that aren't explicit, and basing decisions on observed and future consequences. An interesting thing is that this research has implications on criminal and violent behavior. We have seen through the research of Rain et al. in the past that there is a difference in brain activity of individuals who pleaded not guilty due to reason, reasons of insanity and other healthy participants. There are other researchers that support the correlation of low activity and functioning of the prefrontal cortex with violent behaviors. This could be a result of not being able to engage in system two functioning, such as, or functions, such as the ability to think through our actions and understand long-term consequences. We also know that there are high functioning criminals though, who engage in structured crime, which are not based solely off of impulses. So this is definitely a drawback um, in terms of understanding um, the two different systems and their localization and the 
influence that brain damage has on that. Because it is merely correlational. We don't know whether it is causational. And also because system one and system two are part of a construct that has been developed based on our understanding of tasks that the researchers have uh, put together, um, it is difficult to, to say that these two cognitive systems truly exist. Brain activity is always correlational and its relation to behavior rather is always correlational. So we can say for sure that low activity or damage in the VMPFC is what is causing one to not be able to function with system two. Okay, so that is a major drawback. And these are the researches that um, really give us a range of different conclusions about the system one and system two and dual processing model as a whole. Uh, you really have to choose which ones you would like to use for your responses. In the next class, you will be working on the LAQ question evaluate one or more models of thinking and decision making with reference to a research or to researches. Okay, you can either choose to uh, approach this question with depth or with breadth. If you choose to approach this question with depth, the better option would be to evaluate the dual processing model because there are a lot more researches available to us with different conclusions that can help you evaluate the model. Um, if you choose the breadth approach, you can evaluate both the models, um, theory of reasoned action and planned behavior, and dual processing model, um, and provide research evidence for both. This essay will be due at the end of the week, and you will get class time on Monday to work on it.